We needed strategies for each of them, and the strategies involved law enforcement, diplomacy, financial measures, and intelligence work, and sometimes military action. And we needed to focus in particular on those countries that not only supported terrorists, but also pursued and, as I said, in the case of Iraq, had used WMD. Now, President Bush had to weigh the risks of war in Iraq against the risks of leaving Saddam Hussein in power. And it was a difficult call. It was controversial at the time, and of course, once the war got underway and didn't go well, it became even more controversial. Now, what did President Bush and his national security team see at the start of the administration's first term in 2001? Well, the Saddam Hussein problem was not going away, but what was going away were the remaining vestiges of the UN Security Council's strategy to contain Iraq. The economic sanctions were eroding, and we anticipated that they would soon collapse and Saddam would emerge, emboldened by his victory over the United States and the United Nations. We worried that in his effort to dominate his region, Saddam could aim to deter outside efforts to constrain him by developing his conventional and WMD capabilities along with long-range missiles or possibly terrorist alliances to deliver those weapons. In some future clash over Kuwait or some other Iraqi target, Saddam might draw inspiration from 9-11 and provide terrorists with anthrax, smallpox, or nerve gas to attack us. Or, if he should one day develop a nuclear weapon, he might mobilize yet again to invade Kuwait, this time brandishing a nuke. Now, if that happened, and this was what I think principally weighed on the president when he was considering the issue of war in Iraq, if that happened, critics around the world would demand to know how President Bush could have been so irresponsible as to allow Saddam to retain his biological and chemical weapons programs, let alone get a nuclear weapon. Under those circumstances, who could blame the American people for feeling that their leaders had betrayed their obligation to ensure our national security by ignoring Saddam's history? Who could doubt that the same members of Congress who now criticize President Bush for going to war against Saddam would have condemned him for not having ousted Saddam before the catastrophe. As we've heard, many leading anti-war legislators, including Senators Levin and Rockefeller and Representatives Pelosi and Murtha, made hawkish statements about Saddam in the years before the Iraq War. And such critics could cite their own words to show that they had had the wisdom to call for tough action, while President Bush had thoughtlessly allowed the Iraqi dictator to remain in power until the inevitable occurred. And as I said in my book, they would be right. Now the issue here is not political. It's a matter of the basic responsibility that U.S. national security officials have for their public trust to preserve our country's freedom and safety. Now I've been doing a lot of interviews about my book in recent months and I've heard from a number of journalists and others that the book surprises them in that it, it tells a story that contradicts key parts of almost all the major books about the Iraq War. For example, it refutes the notion that President Bush came into office determined to go to war no matter what, and that the administration refused or failed to consider the arguments against war. In fact, as my book discusses, the most serious analysis of the, of the downsides and risks of war was produced in the Pentagon by Secretary Rumsfeld and his team, not by Colin Powell, Rich Armitage, George Tenet, or other officials who are reputed to have been the voices of caution. My book contradicts the common allegations that the administration manipulated intelligence and that Pentagon civilians did not plan for post-Saddam Iraq. It explains what's wrong with the charge that the State Department had a plan that defense officials discarded. It explains what's wrong with the charge that Secretary Rumsfeld and his advisors were dupes of the, of the Iraqi exile leader, Ahmed Chalabi, and what's wrong with the assertion that we intended to anoint Chalabi as the leader of Iraq. 
I mean, these are all issues that if you'd like to get into more detail in, I'll be happy to discuss it with you. War and Decision quotes extensively from previously classified documents, from numerous memos that were exchanged among Powell and Rumsfeld and Rice and Tenet and General Myers, uh, Vice President Cheney and the President. It recounts numerous meetings, and it does so not on the basis of after the fact interviews conducted years after the discussions, uh, but on the basis of the notes that I took while attending the meetings. Uh, as the Under Secretary, I represented the Pentagon in what was called the Deputies Committee, which was the highest interagency committee short of the cabinet that met on national security affairs. The, the top level meetings were either the National Security Council itself or what was called the Principals Committee, which was the same people as the National Security Council uh, minus the President. And if there was an, a National Security Council meeting or a Principals Committee meeting, the meetings were usually designated Principals plus one and I usually attended as Secretary Rumsfeld's plus one. And, and I used the notes that I took at those meetings to, um, as the basis for the, for the account that I give in the book. Now, in writing the book, I made the radical decision that words would be put in quotation marks only if they were actually spoken by the characters in my history at the very time and place described. And my hope is perhaps I could start a trend uh, the book explains for the, for the first time the key post-war plan developed by the administration, the plan for political transition in post-Saddam Iraq. It was a plan developed in the Defense Department and it aimed to prevent a prolonged U.S. occupation of Iraq. It was a plan to put Iraqis in charge of their own government and country promptly after Saddam's overthrow. It built on our experience in Afghanistan. I'm sure you all recall, in Afghanistan, when we overthrew the Taliban government, we did not set up a U.S. occupation government. Uh, Karzai became the, the chairman of the interim government uh, immediately in December of 2001, and we thought that that was a model that we could build on uh, in Iraq. And the, the, uh, the plan that it was approved by the president for post-Saddam political transition in Iraq was a variation on that Afghan model. But as much of the latter part of my book explains, the plan was undone. And I, I discuss in the book what I think are the harmful consequences that resulted from our not having implemented that plan. Now I tried in the book to be critical about all the work that I discuss, that of other departments and agencies, that of the Pentagon, that of my own office, and myself. And there were a number of things we did that were right. There were a number of things we did that, looking back on, you have to say they were either, they could have been done better or they were just plain wrong. I worked to make my book civil and useful and accurate, as accurate as one man's account can be. Now, I care about accuracy, which is why I relied so heavily on the contemporaneous written record. And it's why I provided footnotes and endnotes so extensively, which is something that I want to stress in particular here in, in this uh, university setting to, to an audience of scholars. The book is about 530 pages long with about 140 pages of notes and reproduced documents. And I want readers to pay attention to the notes, to read them. I'd be happy if they challenge me on my use and interpretation of the documents. I've created a website. I told you the title of the book is War and Decision, and the website is warandecision.com, where anyone can go and easily pull up the unclassified documents and articles and materials that I cite. I'd like to invite all of you to read the book and to visit warandecision.com to plunge into the actual record of the decisions of the Bush administration at the dawn of the war on terrorism. I feel free to promote uh, the book as I'm doing because I'm not making any money from the sales of the book. I've donated 100% of my proceeds to charities that support veterans and their families. Now, more than seven years have passed since I was in the administration working on the conceptual foundation for the war on terrorism. I think the strategy remains sensible. Though jihadist extremism remains a serious threat and one